The Native Americans in America were not always victims during the settlement of the Wild West. Some tribes themselves organized bloody raids and frightened the pilgrims with their harsh way of life. I will tell you about the most ruthless tribes that took the most American lives and what prompted them to do so. I will show you the savages whom even a full regular army was afraid to fight. But why? You will find out at the end. I'll start with the tribe that you can often see in Hollywood westerns, the Cheyenne. And to understand, although it is customary to say that the conquerors of the West annihilated the indigenous people, the figures speak the opposite. If in 1800 the number of Cheyennes was 3,500 people, then by 2010 the number had increased to 11,375 people. Initially, the tribe lived in the Upper Mississippi, and then at the beginning of the 18th century began to migrate west to North and South Dakota. By the beginning of the 19th century, these Native Americans had turned to horse hunting of bison, becoming typical nomads of the Great Plains. Until the 19th century, the Cheyenne did not maintain close contacts with Europeans. However, in 1825 and 1851, they signed a series of treaties with Euro-Americans, and initially the relationship between them was quite peaceful and friendly. However, in 1857, serious armed clashes with whites began after an incident on the Platte River Bridge that resulted in the wounding of a Cheyenne warrior. Americans opened fire on an unarmed tribesman. The U.S. cavalry attacked the Cheyenne camp on Grand Island in Nebraska in retaliation for an attack on white travelers along the Immigrant Trail. And from 1860 to 1878, the Cheyenne actively began participating in full-scale battles with Americans. Sometimes they attacked entire settlements at night and slaughtered everyone, even children. There were about 90 official battles, and the number of military casualties nearly reached 700. Civilian casualties were not included in the statistics, but the Cheyenne tribe entered history as one of the most vindictive and dangerous in the Wild West. Another tribe that lived in the Great Plains were the Arapaho. The history of this people is closely associated with migration and changing their traditional way of life. Originally, they practiced slash-and-burn agriculture and hunting in the territories of Minnesota, North Dakota, and Manitoba. However, in the 17th-18th centuries, they were forced to leave these lands due to pressure from the Sioux and Ojibwe tribes and moved to the Great Plains. There, they gradually switched to horse hunting of bison. The mid-19th century was a time of tense relations with white settlers. The Arapaho and Cheyenne were under threat of attack from the U.S. Army. For example, in 1864, a ranch owner led a troop of whites to attack a group of 15 warriors of the tribe, demanding compensation for returning their own mules. The warriors acted in self-defense, but this clash led to the Sand Creek incident. The U.S. Army attacked the Indian camp, and as a result, more than a hundred Native Americans, including women and children, were brutally killed. After this, the Arapaho people decided to act more ruthlessly, as the settlers were wreaking havoc. There were six battles in which the army suffered losses of 29 killed, but at the same time, more than a hundred civilians were slaughtered in retaliation for the attack of the defenseless Indian camps. It turned out to be an eye for an eye. The River Rogue Indians, or rather a confederation of several tribes, managed to give a decent response to the white settlers. This nation suffered the most from the United States' expansionist policy. In 1850, the ethnic groups in this area were estimated at about 9,500 people, but by 2010, this figure had dropped to 5,100 people. Understandably, this doesn't mean that they were all killed in the heat of war, but such a demographic decline doesn't happen on its own. For a long time, relations between the River Rogue Indians and settlers were quite peaceful. However, everything changed after the discovery of the Oregon Trail and the gold rush in Northern California, which caused territorial conflicts. Gold miners could simply shoot Indian camps if they interfered with their work. The conflicts turned into an open war in 1855, known as the Rogue River War, which lasted until 1856. White settlers began attacking Indian villages, provoking them to retaliate. As a result of the heavy clashes, there were significant losses on both sides. On May 27, 1856, Captain Smith negotiated surrender of the Indians to the U.S. Army, but they set up a trap, organizing a full-scale massacre of American soldiers. It was only stopped by reinforcements that arrived a day later. The Indians retreated and were sent to reservations, but they managed to take the lives of nearly 200 U.S. soldiers with virtually no firearms. The Shoshone, a group of Native American tribes that lived in the western part of the Great Basin, engaged in gathering and hunting. 
Of particular interest is the fact that they were harvesters of wild rice, which is considered a stage even preceding agriculture. By 1500, part of the Shoshone nation crossed the Rocky Mountains and reached the Great Plains. However, with the arrival of European settlers, conflicts arose over territory and resources. In the second half of the 19th century, tensions between the natives and settlers intensified. The expansion of settlers into the Shoshone hunting grounds led to aboriginal attacks on farms and ranches in search of food. The Bear River Massacre in 1863 was the culmination of this conflict. U.S. troops attacked and destroyed about 410 northwestern Shoshones, who were in a winter camp. This was the largest number of casualties the Shoshone suffered at the hands of U.S. forces. Among the dead were many women and children, deliberately killed by American soldiers. As you might guess, the Indians began to retaliate in kind. There was no longer mercy for any civilians. The Shoshones would enter settlements at night and slaughter a couple of houses, then disappear into the darkness. Settlers even propped doors and windows with furniture before going to sleep to somehow protect themselves. But then the houses just started to be set on fire. It is difficult to calculate how many civilians died on both sides. But more than 200 American soldiers were killed. The Paiutes is another tribe that struck fear and awe into the hearts of the early Western settlers in the 19th century. They practiced hunting and gathering, for which they were despised by all their neighbors, including whites, who derogatorily called them diggers due to their ability to dig up roots, which were a significant part of the tribe's diet. The Paiutes lacked horses and guns, which is why even neighboring tribes did not take them seriously. These are exactly the kind of Native Americans with feathers and bows, as often depicted in movies. As a result of armed conflicts, almost half of the Paiute tribe perished. The remaining Paiutes had no choice but to seek reconciliation. The Paiutes, although not representing a formidable military force, were known for their character. These guys went all the way when they started fighting, and their poisoned darts and arrowheads became the stuff of legends and movies. In the early 19th century, their population was about 7,500 people, and by 2010, the number of pure-blooded Native Americans reached 9,340, seemingly an increase. But in terms of global population growth, this ethnic group is on the brink of extinction. The first contacts of the Ute Indians with Europeans were in the 1630s with Spanish explorers, which allowed them to master horses and change their usual way of life. These Native Americans became quite progressive and mobile. But due to their nomadic lifestyle, the Utes began to encounter their neighbors competing for hunting territories. Wars started with the Navajo, Apache, and Comanche. Frictions between the Ute, white settlers, and the gold prospectors in Colorado also led to individual incidents and clashes. Frictions between the Ute, white settlers, and the gold prospectors in Colorado also led to individual incidents and clashes. Although for a time, the tribe even allied with the U.S. in wars against the Navajo and Apache. In 1864, a reservation was created in northeastern Utah, and in 1868, a reservation covering the northern part of Colorado. However, these territories gradually diminished. A piece of land in San Juan was alienated in 1873, and after an incident involving the killing of a Ute agent and white workers in 1879, they lost most of their remaining lands. Thus began full-scale armed conflicts, in which the U.S. Army lost several hundred people. The Utes were excellent with weapons which had been supplied by the Americans themselves, becoming a very dangerous opponent. Essentially, they could only be dealt with thanks to the significant numerical advantage of the U.S. Army. The Sioux tribe, living in the northern Great Plains, is remembered as the most warlike and strong in clashes with the regular U.S. Army. Take, for example, the famous Battle of Little Bighorn, where an American regiment was completely destroyed by the Indians, including its commander, George Custer. The Sioux lived in teepees, mobile homes made of long wooden poles covered with animal skins. Their life was connected with hunting, especially bison, which they killed for meat. The Sioux then dried the meat to store it for a long time and take it with them on campaigns. Women wore dresses made of deer leather with rabbit fur decorations, and men wore leggings and shirts made of deer leather, wearing warm coats made of bison skin and moccasins when needed. But don't judge by appearance. These guys managed to kill more than 1,000 American soldiers, participating in almost a hundred battles. This region became a true symbol of resistance and the struggle of Native American tribes for their territories and culture. The Modoc tribe, living on the border of Oregon and California, has its unique history among the native peoples of the U.S. They are credited with numerous battles with the U.S. Army and the organization of the killing of an American general, which no other tribe did. 
Historically, the Modocs engaged in hunting, gathering and fishing in the area of Little Klamath Valley, Modoc Lake, Chu Lake and the western coast of the Lost Valley River. They hunted small game, fished for salmon and collected roots, berries and reeds for their food. Quite peaceful and calm guys. The Modocs also used reed rafts for collecting water lily seeds and weaving baskets. Their housing consisted of earth wigwams in winter and reed domes in summer. The influence of the cultures of the plains tribes led to the use of tipis, collapsible conical tents covered with animal skins as dwellings. The Modoc tribe was organized according to the Council of Chiefs and Clan leaders. During military actions, they elected a military leader by vote, who acted as a strategist and fighter. Practically a full democracy. For religious rites, sweat lodges were built, and the Modocs appealed to patron spirits for visions and guidance in their affairs. Currently, the number of this ethnic group is 200 people in Oklahoma and 600 people in Oregon. The Modocs are practically on the brink of extinction. The Nez Perce tribe living on the plateau has a rich military history associated with the so-called Nez Perce War of 1877. This conflict began when four clans of the Nez Perce tribe and one clan of the Palaos tribe refused to move to a reservation in Oregon and fled from the US Army, inflicting significant losses on them from ambushes. This episode is considered by Americans as an example of guerrilla warfare. This episode is considered by Americans as an example of guerrilla warfare a tactic that is still studied in military academies. Chief Joseph preferred to lead the tribe to Montana than to Canada, after the US government demanded resettlement to a reservation in 1877. A small Native American community consisting of 350 warriors managed to cover a distance of 2,740 kilometers from Oregon to Montana through Idaho and Wyoming in three months. They fought against well-armed units of the US Army, which had a total strength of 2,000 people. Think about it, 350 against a couple of thousand. During the conflict, the Nez Perce conducted 16 battles with US Army, which suffered significant losses, more than 300 killed and several hundred wounded. Most of the casualties occurred in clever traps, ditches and ambushes set up by the Nez Perce. There were almost no direct confrontations. The Native Americans acted cunningly and sophisticatedly, exhausting the army and avoiding capture. The Kikapu tribe became the most ruthless and effective in the fight for their independence. Although initially the Native Americans led a peaceful lifestyle and compromised with the new authority. The Kikapu lived on a reservation and tried to integrate into American society, learning English, engaging in agriculture and animal husbandry and striving for a peaceful life. However, fearing that their men would be sent to fight for the Confederacy during the Civil War, the Kikapu decided to emigrate to Mexico. Their path lay through Texas, where locals strongly disliked representatives of indigenous peoples. The Kikapu camp was attacked early in the morning, despite attempts to establish contact and good relations with Texas volunteers. Many women and children were killed in the attack, and in response, the Native Americans decided to fight back on foreign land. The desire for revenge and a sense of injustice made Kikapu warriors practically invincible, they didn't stop even after serious injuries, throwing themselves at guns and tearing the enemy apart with their hands. Eventually, the Kikapu tribe was returned to a reservation in the US after a series of clashes with the US Army, as the number of Native Americans was too small to wage a long war. But in just a couple of days, the Kikapu virtually annihilated their Texas attackers, killing more than 100 people involved in the raid on their camp. The US Army specifically allowed them to get revenge, fearing to interfere in the conflict immediately, because no one wanted to mess with the enraged Kikapu. There were even legends about the resurrected Native Americans who marched forward with a bullet-ridden head. As you can understand, most tribes lived peacefully and quietly. Aggression was prompted by the new masters of the Wild West, who themselves attacked, cutting down children and women. The Native Americans were simply forced to respond in kind. Thank you for watching.